Greetings. My name is C.J. Levick, and I am the author and founder of Rock Island Books. I trust you will be blessed as you view this video, and I would like to invite you to assist Rock Island Books in our urgent desire to proclaim the very soon coming of our Lord and the very soon coming of the 70th week of Daniel. The world is about to change in ways we can hardly imagine, and when it does... I am convinced that almost all Christian YouTube videos and Christian media will be censored or removed from the Internet. When we are gone, what will the world think? Will they believe the lies that will be told about our disappearance? Please consider assisting us in getting this message into the places that cannot be canceled by going to Rock Island Books and purchasing one of our 2024 Prophetic Prophecy series, presented on DVDs that cannot be canceled in order that those that remain will have a testimony that might just be the very thing that leads them to the Lord, who is now and always the only hope for lost and dying people and the lost and dying world that is literally passing away. Welcome to the Mystery of the Apostasy. One of the most controversial verses in the entire Bible is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, where it says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The dispute arises in verse 3 where it says, No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. The debate over the Greek word apostasia, or apostasia, that was translated departure in the first seven English versions of the Bible, has more recently, since the year 1611, been translated into English as rebellion, or falling away. Clearly, there is a difference of opinion regarding the original meaning of the Greek word apostasia, which has been translated as both a departure in the first seven English translations of the Bible and the falling away rebellion and apostasy in almost all the English translations since 1611 AD. The importance of this distinction between the spiritual departure of the church and the physical departure of the church has created both conflict and confusion. To be clear, most of those that believe in the pre-tribulation departure of the church also subscribe to the idea that there is a falling away rebellion and apostasy that comes before the departure of the church, as most Christians are instructed by the more modern translations of the Bible that seem to teach that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3, is about the spiritual departure of the church, not the physical departure of the church. Now clearly the Bible teaches us that there will be a spiritual departure from the faith in the last days. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 3-4, through 4, we read, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap on themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we read, To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The Amen and faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The idea of the spiritual departure of the church is both the conventional understanding of the word apostasia, translated apostasy, falling away and rebellion, and is confirmed by almost all modern Greek scholars today, and with few exceptions, that understanding is not contested by the majority of Christians, including those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. The idea that there will be a spiritual rebellion against the once-delivered unchangeable gospel that includes the death, the burial, and resurrection, and I might add the blessed hope as revealed in 1 Corinthians 15, 
seems to be supported by all other scriptures, such as 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. At this point, we need to ask three questions. Number one, has there ever been a time in church history when the true faith once delivered, the faith in the Son of God that included his birth, death, burial, and resurrection, has not been under attack. And while we are on the subject of attack, we are told by the Apostle Peter that in the last days, the one doctrine that will be mocked and scoffed is the doctrine of the blessed hope. This is the promise made to the 11 disciples of Jesus on the very day he died, a promise that was not only made for them, but to all of us who have put our faith and trust in the risen Lord. Listen carefully to what Jesus says to all those that will follow him, which includes every single Christian who has become an overcomer based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, adding nothing to that one and only blood atonement that stamps and stains our ticket to heaven as both under the blood and paid in full. Let's put the promise that Jesus made to his disciples and to us that believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John 14, we read, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So while it is true that every age has its defectors, the falling away at the end times will be unique as it includes an added piece of information that has become prominently manifest in the very end of the church age. Let's read it again. 2 Peter 3.3 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It would not be difficult to add 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 into the evidence folder that supports the idea that at the end, before the revelation of the man of sin, the son of perdition, popularly known as the Antichrist, who will appear on the scene to deceive the nations. His disclosure inaugurates the seven-year, 2520-day time of Jacob's trouble, which unleashes the wrath of God upon the earth to bring his vengeance upon all his enemies. This period of seven years also brings an end to the unbelief of the Jews, who will in the end be delivered from God's wrath as they finally repent of their unbelief and cry out to the true Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Keep in mind that the purpose of the first seven years of the day of the Lord, a day that lasts for over a thousand years, is twofold. The tribulation is vengeance upon the unrepentant, unrighteous earth dwellers, and the tribulation is also meant to bring about the salvation of repentant and believing Israel, who will finally recognize Jesus, Yeshua, as the true Messiah. As they call upon the Lord, saying, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. If we accept the idea that apostasy and the revelation of the man of sin must happen first as they usher in the day of the Lord, we are left with a question that begs for an answer. If the church is not to depart until after the apostasy, the revelation of the man of sin, and by definition after the day of the Lord has begun, then when does the church depart? When is the church raptured? The majority, but not all the Christian pastors and teachers are quick with an answer to this question that leaves many believers with one sad and fearful conclusion. No matter when the departure of the church happens according to this interpretation, it must happen sometime during or after the end of the great and terrible day of the Lord. In other words, the blessed hope is not based on the promise that we simply escape the wrath of God, but is simply an encouragement to Christians that we must endure to the middle or just before the end or until the end of the 70th week of Daniel that we call the time of Jacob's trouble, which includes the Great Tribulation. Christians today are exposed to varied end times views that all suggest that the church will be going through the most horrible, terrible period of time to ever come upon the earth. We who are looking for the Lord to come and snatch us away are told we are optimistic escapists we are scolded and told that we better get used to the idea and stop wishing for a pie-in-the-sky promise that is simply a fanciful excuse 
that will leave us unprepared to go through the coming tribulation that the Bible describes as like nothing that is ever or ever will happen again. Since nothing in the past can compare to the epidemic of war, starvation, pestilence, torture, destruction, calamitous earthquakes, storms and tsunamis and volcanic eruptions, pollution and hailstorms that cast down rocks as large as cars, followed by death, terror, and in a word, unimaginable tragedy. And what is this eschatology based on? The answer is that one of the primary proofs is 2 Thessalonians 2.3, where we are told, No one is to deceive you in any way. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. At this crossroads in the video, based on the natural progression of what I have taught so far, you might expect that I would launch into the myriad of reasons that give testimony to the fact that the word translated into English as apostasy, based on the Greek word apostasia, should better have been translated as describing the physical departure of the church, what is known by all as the pre-tribulational rapture. And believe me when I tell you that before I reached this junction in the video, that was exactly what I was planning on doing. And to be clear, I do have plans to do exactly that, but in a future video. But that is not what I'm going to do in this video, and I'd like to tell you why. I believe, of course, that God's Word is perfect and without error in the original language in which it was revealed. This includes both Greek and Hebrew. But I also believe that those that truly honored God's Word and made an honest effort to translate the Bible into the languages of the world, including English, were superintended by the Holy Spirit. Thinking about this gave me pause as I began to realize that the Lord would never allow such a critical and important revelation to be misunderstood or corrupted so that it might mislead or discourage His children that both love Him and are looking forward to His coming and are living in the final generation that would see His coming. Whenever I get a little miffed or confused about what the scriptures mean, I always take it to the Lord who has made this promise to me and all His children. We read it in John 16, verse 13. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak for himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. With this promise in hand and heart, I began to study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-3 through 3, in the original Greek based on my study. I would like you to notice that there are four events announced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-3. through 3. Each event is announced by the Greek definite article ho, which is translated into English as the, T-H-E, the. Why is this important? The answer is discovered in the original Greek that informs us that the Greek word translated the changes the emphasis of the word it prepends in order that you might know that what it is announcing, a person or a thing, is the only one of its kind and thus distinguishes the object of the article from all other persons or things. In other words, it announces something that is noteworthy and unique as it is something that is assumed knowledge, or put another way, something that would be known to the reader based on the context which in this case is based on not only the revelation that Paul imparted to the church of Thessalonica, but also the entire Bible. Also to those of us that believe the biblical revelation is superintended by the Holy Spirit, ensuring that the original revelation as written in the original language is God's word. There is one translation of the Bible in which the definite article ho in Greek translated the in English is missing. And since many of you rely on this translation, including myself, I thought it would be helpful to clarify this unfortunate mistranslation. The KGV Bible is based on the Textus Receptus, which I consulted. What I discovered is that the Textus Receptus is in perfect agreement with all the other English translations as the definite article ho that should have been translated as the. In other words, the translators, for reasons I do not understand, either made an error in translation or purposely did not include that all-important definite article, ho, which should have been translated, the falling away, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. This omission was corrected in the New King James Version, which translates it correctly. If this upsets anybody, please do not shoot the messenger, but investigate this for yourself as the Textus Receptus is available for scrutiny to anyone with even an elementary knowledge of the Greek language. 
and you can verify that what I am reporting in this article is true. And since our aim is to know what the Lord communicated in the original manuscripts, including the Textus Receptus, we need to simply acknowledge that while the Textus Receptus is trustworthy, the English translation in this one instance failed to report something that dramatically changes, something that the Lord wants us to know. See if you can notice how the Greek definite article ho, even when translated into English where it loses much of its force, still retains the concept of something set apart, unique, and definitive. Even the English word the can change the meaning of what it announces. Here are just a few examples based on the general context of the Bible. A flood. Well, that could be any flood. But when we say the flood, we all know we're talking about Noah's flood. An abomination. Well, the Bible talks about lots of abominations. But when we say the abomination, everybody knows we're talking about the abomination of desolation. What about a resurrection? Well, there have been lots of resurrections in the Bible. But when we say the resurrection... That can only be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What about a day of the Lord? Well, that could be any Saturday. But when we say the day of the Lord, everybody knows what we're talking about. What about tribulation? Well, there's lots of tribulation and it's promised that every Christian in every age is going to suffer it to one extent or another. All that follow Jesus are going to experience tribulation. But when we say the tribulation, we're talking about something completely different, something unparalleled. And we know we're talking about the tribulation that begins with the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, with this in mind, please notice the following four noteworthy, unique, one-of-a-kind events being announced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. First, we have the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Well, this is not the first or last time the Lord will come. It is the one and only time that the Lord is coming to gather us to be with him in the clouds, where he then escorts us to the Father's house, where he has prepared a place for us, just like he promised he would in the Gospel of John chapter 14. This is unique. And while this may take some time, the coming of our Lord begins in an instant of time. It is definitive, and all who are in Christ at the coming will be escorted to heaven, and they will know it and experience it at the same time. First, those who are resurrected in Christ, and second, those who are alive at his coming, who will be snatched away physically, departing the earth. Second, we have the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord will last as a thousand years, but it begins in one moment of time at the appointed time. Those that are dwelling on the earth will on an appointed day experience and know that it has begun. The scriptures tell us even when it begins. The time of Jacob's trouble must begin on Tishri 10, as it is also the 70th week of Daniel that must begin on the exact prophesied and rehearsed start date. The 70th week of Daniel will begin and end on Tishri 10, the Day of Atonement. To be clear, each seven-year sabbatical cycle begins and has begun in the past and will in the future on exactly the same day on God's calendar, separated in time by exactly seven years on God's calendar. There are no exceptions, and so we are to know when the tribulation will begin and when the season or appointed time has arrived, a time in which God's wrath is poured out on the world in ever-increasing fury and is unlike any other period of tragedy ever recorded, including the judgment of the flood. So as each seven-year sabbatical cycle starts and ends, we are to understand that the next sabbatical cycle could be, I say could be, the one. And we are also given the promise that the children of the light will know ahead of time. Each time, one of these appointed seven-year cycles will begin and be enlightened to the fact that one of these recurring sabbatical cycles could be the one that begins the seven years of Jacob's trouble. This will also be the first seven years of the day of the Lord that will be as a thousand years, including the thousand-year reign of Yeshua on the earth. In other words, Christians will be looking for the Lord to come to gather them together in the clouds at any time. But we will be on high alert, not sleeping, as we approach the only time every seven years that a new Shemitah cycle ends and another seven-year Shemitah cycle begins. 
we will be aware and on high alert because we know that we will be taken, snatched, rescued, and gathered together for the purpose of being escorted to heaven in glorified bodies, fulfilling the promise that Yeshua gave to us in John 14. And this will happen before the tribulation. Now let's look at the third event announced in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 3. Now notice the apostasy we are told comes first. For it will not come unless the apostasy, the apostasy, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now let me ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in church history, during the church age that began at Pentecost, where there's not been a time when the foundational doctrines of the church have not been challenged? The church has been in a constant state of falling away, backsliding, and rebellion since its inception. The next thing we notice is that the apostasy of the church is connected to the fact that the man of lawlessness is revealed. Note the following as recorded in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. What will not come first? The answer is the day of the Lord that begins the 70th week of Daniel that is called the time of Jacob's trouble, what we know as the tribulation. Notice also that the apostasy that comes first is directly connected with the revelation of the man of lawlessness, the person popularly known as the Antichrist. What is the context of both First and Second Thessalonians? The answer is the departure of the church. Second Thessalonians 2.1 says, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Christ and our gathering together to him. Just so there is no confusion, there are two separate events revealed in this verse. First, Jesus is coming, and second, we are going to be gathered together to him. How does this happen? You may ask, and what does it have to do with the apostasy and the revelation of the man of sin? Notice two things. First notice that the apostasy and the man of sin are connected. By this we are to understand that they happen either at the same time or one immediately follows the other. Which is it? I don't know, but my guess is that either way we are talking about a relatively little amount of time between the two events. They are both unique, definitive, never-to-be-repeated events that happen one after another based on the revelation of God's Word in the Greek. And even in the English, you are meant to understand that these two events are co-joined. And while the time between them is unknown, it is also clear that there is not much time, if any, between these two prophesied events. At this point, I want to introduce you to a truth that once understood will leave you in no doubt that the spiritual departure of the church and the physical departure of the church, both must happen at exactly the same time. And if you think about it, even for a bit, you will begin to understand why there is absolutely no difference in the outcome between those that believe apostasia means spiritual departure or falling away, and those that believe apostasia means the physical departure of the church. Because no matter what position you take, or whether you believe that apostasia means spiritual falling away or physical departure, the Lord has revealed this in such a precise way in the original language, in the original Greek, that upon careful inspection reveals that both result in exactly the same thing. So how is this, you might ask? The answer is also found in the scripture and requires only a brief explanation. We begin with the fact that Jesus will come in the clouds above the earth. Notice that Jesus does not touch down on the earth in this coming. Those that have died will rise to meet the Lord in the air, having been changed into a glorified body, and we who are alive will also be changed and meet the Lord in the air, where we will be guided by the Lord to heaven, where we will be welcomed into the Father's house, where a new home has been prepared by the Lord for each of us, and so we shall forever be with the Lord. When does this happen? We are told it happens in an instant of time. It is a unique, one-of-a-kind, definitive event. And what happens when all those in Christ are removed from the earth in that instant? What happens in that same instant of time? Well, we know what happens in heaven. The gates of heaven are opened and the redeemed, fully and completely glorified, vanish from the earth. But what happens on the earth? What happens to the apostate false church that boasts over one billion congregants? 
The answer is that the church buildings and all the millions of professing Christians who were never born again never had a heart change based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The kinos, the Christians in name only, will they remain on the earth? In other words, the false church is left fully apostate. Absent are all the Holy Spirit-filled followers of Christ, and it happens in an instant, just like God's Word said it does. So however you look at this, whether you believe in this physical departure or the spiritual departure, the final result is exactly the same. Let me give you an example. If you take a bucket and you fill it with 100 ounces of water and then throw in a rotting dead fish, what do you have? The answer is simple. You have a bucket, which for the sake of this illustration, we will call the church buildings. This bucket is filled with 100 ounces of clean water, which we will call the true believing church, the children of promise. You then add to the bucket a rotting dead fish, which we will call the unbelieving worldlings who show up in church and rub shoulders with true Christians, but instead of being born again and filled with God's Spirit, they are filled with the Spirit of this age. And while they may have an outward profession of faith, they have no inward heart change and are guided by the wisdom of this world instead of the wisdom that comes from above. By the way, if you put a smelly, rotten, dead fish in water, believe it or not, you don't smell it. The stench of death, as long as the fish is in the water, does not appear. But what happens when you pour the water out of the bucket? What is left? The answer is a bucket, which is a picture of the apostate church, that now contains only a dead, rotten fish that smells to high heaven. What's missing? The answer is the water is missing. The true church has left. And what is left in a bucket that contains nothing of any spiritual value? The answer is the water is missing. The true church has left. And what is left in a bucket that contains nothing of any spiritual value? The true church has departed. The church age is over. The dispensation of grace and favor that began on Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago has come to an end. The contents of what remains in the bucket, the professing but spiritless carcass of a once living church, has become instantly, uniquely, and definitively apostate, just like the Bible says. Not that the fish was alive and decided to die, but the fish was dead already. And when the water was removed, the smell immediately was witness to the fact that there was no longer any life as all those with spiritual life had, as they say, left the building. And all this happened in a moment. The moment the water departed the bucket. The moment that those who were in Christ were bodily removed from the earth. The moment the church went from living to dead in the blink of an eye as all who were truly in Christ have been called by the last trump to meet the Lord in the air in order to be lovingly escorted to their heavenly home. So, if you are asked, what happened? You could say the bucket became instantly, uniquely, and definitively apostate. Or you could say... The water immediately departed from the bucket. Both happened at the same time, and no matter how you describe it, you are left with an apostate, false, spiritless church on the earth and a heaven above, now filled with all those in Christ, both those that were alive at his coming and those that were dead and resurrected. The Spirit of Truth superintended the translation in order that we might understand the simple truth that the departure of the church comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed, followed by the day of the Lord. There will soon be an immediate twinkling of an eye departure that leaves the professing, rotten shell of a false church and religious system that is fully and completely apostate. This event signals the end of the church age and the departure of all those who are in Christ heralds the end of the church age as what is left is only buildings filled with unbelieving worldlings whose only hope is to repent and believe with the promise that they may yet become tribulation saints, but will experience tribulation and very likely death at the hands of a world now missing the restraining influence of true Christians and the Holy Spirit of God, true Christians that are now completed in Christ and in heaven. So if you are left behind when this event takes place, is there any hope for you? The answer is yes, but it demands that you cast off any cherished hope you have for the world and that you do not love your own life, as you are commanded not to take the mark of the beast and not to love your own life even unto death. 
At the time we recorded this video, the opportunity to repent and believe in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is still available, but it won't be for long. If you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, now is the time. Exploring the Lord's 7,000-Year Sabbatical Calendar Connecting the prophecy dots in the Bible is like opening a thousand-piece puzzle box, dumping all the pieces on the table, and working tirelessly to assemble them. Well, actually, prophetic puzzles can be much more difficult, in fact, impossible without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and a bold faith that believes God and understands that God is never wrong, and that His Word is 100% trustworthy. We all struggle with our own spiritual blindness. God has no such problem, and He is kind and gracious to those who are seeking Him with all their hearts, in order to know Him better, in order to understand Him more fully, and the only way that happens is with His help. So I pray for His help as I do my best to share with you where we are on God's prophetic calendar. There are literally hundreds of prophetic puzzle pieces in the Bible, but just like the box that contains all the puzzle pieces, the frame around the puzzle needs to be connected before the puzzle picture can come into focus. The short prophetic puzzle pieces in this nutshell epilogue will be put at the end of all my future videos in order to reveal the 10 biblical proofs that I am depending upon as the foundation for teaching what the scripture reveals about the Lord's prophetic sabbatical 7,000 year calendar, the oldest biblical prophecy perspective in the entire world. To accomplish this in 15 minutes means I am only presenting a very brief and abbreviated summary of a corpus of my own published and unpublished videos and articles produced in the past 10 years that are hundreds of hours long, distilled and condensed to a brief overview in the hope that this will give you the confidence to explore in much greater depth the prophetic vistas published in this and upcoming videos. So this will not answer all your questions, but it will answer the question, how do I know the dates I'm disclosing are correct? After all, a 7,000-year prophetic calendar with an incorrect and unreliable start date, well, it may get close to the mark, and 100 years ago would have been interesting, a novelty. 50 years ago, it would have been very interesting, and 10 years ago, it would have been exciting. But producing such a calendar months before it is announcing the departure of the church? Well, you better know what you're talking about, and your sources better be impeccable. So yes, I am not unaware of the risks of producing something that ends up being wrong. I'm more aware of the risk of sitting on my hands when there is urgent need for saints and sinners to know where we are on God's prophetic time clock. I am confident that what I am sharing is correct. The question remains, who am I listening to? What are my sources? How in the world can I know that the dates I am depending upon to come to my conclusions are correct? Let's begin with a question I get most often that is also the key date that unlocks most of the other prophetic dates on God's 7,000-year calendar. So question one, how do I know that Yeshua died on the cross on Nisan 14, April 5th in 30 AD on the Roman calendar? Obviously, there are many proofs of this historically recognized date. But how do I know that 30 AD is the crucifixion date of Yeshua? Now, at this point, I could spend an hour explaining all this and hardly scratch the surface. And it would be worth watching. But please remember, this is a Bible prophecy summary in a very small nutshell. So let's begin. The answer is found in Ezekiel 4, verses 6 and 7. You might want to go and read the entire chapter. Listen to what the Lord told Ezekiel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. The time of iniquity prophesied by Ezekiel was 40 years to be followed by a siege of Jerusalem. The siege of Jerusalem, prophetically in view, happened exactly 40 years after the crucifixion of Yeshua that took place in 30 AD. In other words, the 70 AD siege of Jerusalem minus 40 years lands you or takes you back to the year 30 AD just as God said it would through his prophet Ezekiel. 
The iniquity of Judah was the worst crime ever committed on earth as it was the crucifixion of the Son of God. So the answer to the question, how do I know Jesus was crucified on Nisan 14, April 5th, 30 AD? Well, the Bible tells me so. Question two, how do I know Adam sinned in the year 3971? In Genesis 1-1, this question is answered in the first Hebrew word in the Bible. I call this the Bereshit Passover prophecy that reveals the first evangelium, the gospel story and pictures, and then based on the Hebrew script that is also Numbers, reveals the time duration in Numbers in the first word in the Bible, just like Isaiah prophesied in chapter 46, 9 and 10. Listen to what the prophet says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. A word directly from God, spoken through the prophet Isaiah. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit, and it fulfills this prophecy. Ta 400 times Yod 10, God's multiplier, 10 being ordinal perfection, equals 4,000. 4,000 years takes us to the cross event. The cross event happened in 30 AD, so we go back in time, 4,000 years, and it reveals the year that the first Adam sinned in 3971. So, answer number two, how do I know Adam sinned on a little 29 in 3971 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question three, how do I know that Yeshua was born in 5 BC? Well, this mystery is solved when you understand that the last Adam was patterning his life, death, and resurrection, that's Yeshua HaMashiach, in order to undo or reverse the curse of the first Adam that sinned. Since Adam was created on the sixth day of creation, on Tishri 6, and we know he sinned in the year 3971 BC, let's do the math. The life of Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his three-and-a-half-year ministry that began in the fall and ended with his resurrection on Nisan 17, three days after his Wednesday crucifixion on Nisan 14. April 5th, 30 A.D. is when Jesus died on the cross. Thirty-three-and-a-half years times 365.25 equals 12,235 days. That's the number of days between the birth of Yeshua and his resurrection on April 8, 30 A.D. If we go back 33 and a half years, 12,235 days from the resurrection of Yeshua starting the day count on the Sabbath of Nisan, 17, we land on Tishri 6 in the year 5 B.C. On the Roman calendar, this is October 8, 5 B.C. Yeshua was born right in the middle of the period of time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Isn't that interesting? But what is more interesting is that it is exactly the same month and year that Adam was created on the sixth day of the creation week. Pattern is prophecy. So answer number three, how do I know Yeshua was born in the fall of 5 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question four, how do I know the year of creation on the Roman calendar is 4005 BC? Well, the Tishri 6 birth of Yeshua matches perfectly the Tishri 6 creation of the first Adam. Tishri 6 in 5 BC on the Roman calendar in October 8th was when Jesus was born. Discovering the creation date can be calculated now that we know when Yeshua was born in 5 BC and when we know the duration of time and days between Yeshua's birth and his resurrection. We can now calculate when the first Adam was created and that year also give us the creation date as Adam was created on the sixth day of the first creation week. If we start from a little 29, the day and month that ends the sabbatical year that the first Adam sinned in 3971, and go backwards in time, 12,235 days, we will discover the day and year that the first Adam was created. 3971 B.C., going back 12,235 days on the 360-day-for-a-year calendar that God established in the beginning takes you to the 6th of Tishri in the creation week of 4005 B.C. So the answer to number four is, how do I know the creation date was Tishri 1, 4005 B.C.? The Bible tells me so. Question five, how do I know... 
when the 7,000-year countdown for mankind ends? If we go back to the Bereshit Passover prophecy, we find the answer. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the first word in the Bible, the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit. Ta 400 times Yod 10 equals 4,000. From sin to the crucifixion of Yeshua that happened in 30 AD on the Roman calendar. The Yod 10 times Sheen, 300, plus 1 equals 3,001 years. Going forward 3,001 years from the cross event of 30 AD takes us to the very important future date on the Roman calendar of 3031 AD. The 7,000-year countdown on God's sabbatical calendar also takes us to the end of the millennial reign of Christ, who returns back to his home in heaven at the end of his 1,000-year reign that ends in 3031 AD. So answer 5. The 7,000-year countdown for mankind ends in 3031 AD. And this is also the time that concludes the 1,000-year reign of Yeshua on the earth. How do I know this? The Bible tells me so. If the 7,000-year countdown ends in the year 3031, then we now have a very important milestone by which we can authoritatively answer a couple more questions. So question number six, when is the second coming of Christ? The answer is 3031 AD, going back in time exactly 1,000 years, lands us on the year 2031 AD. This is the year of the second coming of Christ that begins the millennial reign of Yeshua. Answer 6. How do I know the second coming of Christ and the start date for the millennium is 2031 AD? The answer is the Bible tells me so. Question 7. Knowing that 2031 is the end of the 70th week of Daniel, we can go back in time exactly seven years and discover the very year that the 70th week of Daniel begins. So answer seven. The 70th week of Daniel begins in the year 2024 A.D. 2024 A.D. is the year that the 70th week of Daniel begins, ending seven years later on the Day of Atonement, on a Jubilee year that ends with the second coming of Yeshua in 2031 A.D. to reign in Jerusalem with a rod of iron for exactly 1,000 years. And so the time of Jacob's trouble ends in 2031 A.D. Question number eight. When does the 6,000 years God appointed for man to work come to an end? Going backwards in time, 3,000 years from the conclusion of the 7,000-year sabbatical calendar gives us the date for the beginning of the fifth day on God's 1,000-year-for-a-day calendar, confirming that it begins the year after the crucifixion of Yeshua in 30 A.D. It begins in 31 A.D. To be clear, the fifth day begins in 31 A.D. and ends in 1031 A.D., and the sixth day begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. And finally, the seventh day begins in 2031, and on the Roman calendar it ends in 3031 A.D. So the answer to question 8, the sixth day that the Lord prophesied would be the 6,000th and final year for man to work begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. Question number nine. And when did the prophetic 7,000-year sabbatical calendar begin? So going back 7,000 years from 3031 A.D. lands us on the year 3970 B.C., the year after the sin of Adam, the first Adam that sinned in 3971 B.C. So check your own date duration calendar and you will discover that the number of years between 3970 B.C. and 3031 A.D. is exactly 7,000 years. I know it looks like it's 7,001, but it's not. This is correct. Remember... We have a problem every time we go between B.C. and A.D. as we have to make a correction. And keep in mind the second proof of this date based on the fact that pattern is prophecy. And so when you go forward 35 years from the creation date of 4005, we land on the end of the fifth and the beginning of the sixth sabbatical cycle, the sixth sabbatical year that begins in the year 3970 after completing five sabbatical years after creation date of 4005 B.C. 
So answer number nine, the 7,000 year sabbatical prophetic calendar began the countdown to eternity in the year 3970 BC. It is interesting that the first sabbatical week of years was interrupted by the sin event that took place in 3971, exactly 34 years from creation to sin. And when does sinful man need a savior? The answer is after the sin of Adam in 3971 that corrupted all mankind and left us without hope until we were rescued by the grace of God based on the finished work of Yeshua as he paid the penalty for our sins on a wooden cross 1994 years ago in the year 30 AD. Does 34 years complete the fifth sabbatical year from creation? The answer is no. But 35 does, as 35 is divisible by 7 with no remainder, further confirming the start date of the Lord's sabbatical 7,000-year calendar from mankind in 3970 B.C. And finally, question number 10. How do I know when Yeshua is coming back to take us home? The answer is, I don't. But I do know this. It's soon. Very soon.